Today, we will bless the palm, recall the procession of Jesus into the gates of Jerusalem, and then I will bless all of you holding the palm. So during the Passion, later on, hold up the palm. But now, as we prepare the blessing, I invite you also to hold up your palm. My friends, since the beginning of Lent, until now, we have been preparing our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today, we gather together to herald with the whole church the beginning of the Paschal mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say, the passion and resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that he entered his own city, Jerusalem. Therefore, with one faith and devotion, let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation following in his own footsteps, so that, being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may also share his resurrection and his life. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, sanctify these branches with your blessing, that we who follow Christ our King in exaltation may reach the eternal Jerusalem with him, who lives and reigns with you, now and forever. Amen. The Passion, according to Mark. Some say Mark's Gospel started with the Passion and then he filled in the details. There's a theme in Mark's Passion and Mark's Gospel that we see very evident today as we read this last section of the physical life of Christ on earth. And yet we see them through the eyes of different personalities. The Passion is our story. What does it reveal? What part do we play in the Passion of the Christ? Here are some of the guides of the Passion, as we heard. We have Peter. These are the people that Jesus had to deal with. The boastful one. I'll never deny you. And winds up denying him three times. These are the people and the personalities that Jesus had to deal with. The sleeping disciples. They're going to defend him. And when the master returns, they couldn't keep their eyes open. Betrayal, apathy, sleeping, denial, fear. These are the people Jesus had to deal with. And Judas, rabbi, with a kiss, and sells him. Judas, one of the betrayers. These are the people that Jesus had to deal with. Then there were the soldiers who did their job. They had to do their job. They were doing it without conscience. They were following instructions. And they took it an extra step to ridicule and spit and crown with thorns. They did their job. Then, of course, there was Simon of Cyrene. Even God needs a hand once in a while. So Jesus is there carrying the burden of his wooden cross, and Simon is constricted to help him. God needs a hand. God needs us to assist him, it seems. The personalities of the Passion. The women who tended to his needs, who were there at afar watching him, and who cared for him, quietly, at a distance, even to the point where eventually they will come to prepare the body for burial. Barabbas. You know what that name means? Barabbas? Son of God. No. Son of Abba, the father. Barabbas. When Jesus is in the Passion, he speaks to Abba, Father. And Barabbas is the one the people choose above the son of the father, the true son of the father. The crowds of Gethsemane, these are the people Jesus had to deal with. The gang, the mass hysteria, gangs 
with swords and clubs and, and their tongues as weapons. These are the personalities that your Lord and mine had to deal with at his passion. The servant girl, the nosy one, the one who put her two cents in, the troublemaker. Are some of these characters coming into play? Are some of these characters moving into our understanding of the 21st century personalities that Jesus still has to deal with? And then the centurion, the outsider, a man of faith, the pagan with faith. Truly, this is the Son of God. Sometimes we need a non-believer to point the way to what we already believe. Sometimes the example of a non-believer is more powerful than that of the believers. Paul tells us in his letter, beautiful letter to the Philippians that our attitude must be Christ's attitude. So as we look at the personalities of the passion, we realize, yes, every knee should bend because he's exalted, but what did he do? He emptied himself of his glory. He emptied himself as, of his divinity and became one of us. From on high, from the exalted position of creator's son, Jesus empties himself and becomes one of us. He embraces our humanity. And that's a theme that Mark focuses on throughout his gospel. Christ Jesus, Son of the Father, embracing our humanity. And we are invited to enter his story. Because the personalities of the passion are still the personalities in our lives, in one way or the other. With betrayal, with thugs, with poor example, with being nosy. The personalities of the passion are still there. And what does Jesus say on the cross that is misinterpreted? They say he's calling upon Elijah. He wasn't calling upon Elijah. He was quoting Psalm 22 that we heard beautifully read. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So on the cross it looks like Christ is totally abandoned by God. We need to know that because as we continue Psalm 22, we realize it's not a psalm of abandonment, but a psalm of hope. When all seems lost, my God, my God, you've abandoned me. I proclaim your name to all, because you who fear the Lord praise him, and all the descendants will give him praise and glory. Confidence in the Father who created him. He's quoting the psalm that seemed like hopelessness that turns out to be total dependence on the Father, on the Creator. Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, we know the transfiguration, we know the miracles, but Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, shares with us especially His humanity. And He unites His humanity with ours. He unites his humanity with ours now in the 21st century as he did on the cross and through his life on earth. He identifies with the poor. He identifies with the sufferings of the homeless. He identifies with the torture. He identifies with the humanity in each one of us, whether that humanity is betrayal or denial or murder. He identifies with the inequalities of society with persecution, with injustice, whether perpetrated against male or female, Christian, Muslim, or Jew, Jesus identifies because God became man, telling us through his example, showing us through his words, how uniting his sufferings with us, we can unite our sufferings with him because he became one of us, Mark uncovers this eventually in the Gospel, doesn't he? Here's Jesus. And who is it proclaiming? Here's Jesus, Son of God. Not the apostles, they're gone. 
Not the women, they're at a distance. The pagan. Here is the Son of God. Sometimes society needs us, and sometimes we need society, secular society, to find the spiritual in secular society, to find the hopeful in secular society. And surely the centurion points that out to us. The secret is out. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Mark, the secret is so important. Don't tell anyone what you saw with the transfiguration. Don't tell anyone what you saw after this miracle or that miracle. Keep it quiet. Why is Mark keeping it quiet? Because it's going to be in the hands of the centurion to unveil Jesus, to point Jesus to the world, to a man of the world, a person of the world, a pagan of the world. The other themes of Jesus' life and the personalities? How everyone in the world has value and every good deed in the world gives glory to God no matter who performs that good deed? And it's up to us with the eyes of faith to see the unveiling of God's goodness in all creatures, in all people, in the poor, in the suffering. Jesus really... He identifies with us. He became a human being because Jesus wants to be next to that child visiting her mother in the nursing home who may even not know the child is there. Jesus wants to be next to the nurse or caretaker taking care of that infirm person. Jesus wants us to know that he's with us when the husband of a woman dying of cancer says he's losing his faith because why should a good God do this to my wife? Jesus did it first. Jesus walked the earth first to identify with us. No tear that we've shed, no blood that we've shed, no cross that we've carried, Jesus hasn't done it first. I can't imagine what was going through Mary's mind. All the promises from Gabriel on, and here he is, dead, on the cross. Jesus did that, emphasizing his humanity in the Gospel of Mark. The author of Mark's Gospel portrays the humanity of Jesus because we need to know in our humanity we're going to be confronted by the same personalities, we're going to be confronted by the same temptations to deny him, to forget him, to remove him out of my life. How could a good God hurt my wife with these children? How could a good God hurt my mother who's infirm? How could a good God leave a whole slew of people in the developmental center feeble? What's the answer? Get on to the answer. Jesus was there. Jesus embraced it. And had it been perfect as it was created, none of it would have happened. The cross would not have had happened. But we got in the way. Creation got in the way. Nature got in the way. And in order for our God to let us know that he's with us, he got in the way. He becomes a human being. He walks, he's spit upon, he's betrayed. And there's value in that suffering. There's value in the suffering of the, the husband and children who suffer through the, the agonizing illness of their mother and wife. Jesus is there with his hand on his shoulder and his hand in her hand, lifting up the children. Jesus did it first. We identify with Jesus' sufferings. He identifies with our sufferings. We're one with him. He's one with us. That's why we have the passion of the Christ, because he wants us to know we're not walking this earth alone but he's with us. It's our invitation to walk with him. Think back to John Paul II. Remember when he was elected? He was a superstar. 
went to media, he was a poet, he was an author, he was an actor, became a pope, traveled the world. Everyone looked at him. His funeral was attended by more people than we can imagine. And this superstar, toward the end of his life, did not say, you know, can't go out there now. Read this message to my people. This superstar studying, suffering from Parkinson's. Not, not able to hold his hand still. Not able to sit straight in a chair, dribbling often. And for his last Christmas, we were there in Rome. And yes, real dribble. He didn't say, I don't want the people of God to see me suffer. I don't want the people of God to see me normal. I don't want the people of God to see me as they see their mothers and fathers in the nursing homes or suffering like the people in any part of the world that suffer. I don't want the people of God to see me that way. No, he said, I want the people of God to see me as I am. And until he closed his eyes in death, he was there reaching out to serve the people of God in the best way he knew how. And we saw John Paul, the star, dribble. We saw John Paul, the super pope, weak. He was following Jesus. And that's what we are destined to do in the passion and in our lives. Follow Jesus because first Jesus followed us. Even when we hear in the resurrection, he comes back to his disciples. He doesn't get cleaned up. Remember, he had the wounds. He showed the wounds. Look at my side. Stick your fingers in there. The body of Christ suffered. The body of Christ, the church, still suffers. The risen, exalted Christ did not give up. The body of Christ on earth, the church, can do no less. The passion is for us to open our eyes to the, the pains in the world, whether those pains are from illness or family stress, spouses or children, alcoholism or abuse. Christ was there to minister, and he expects us, his people, as we walk through this passion with him, to minister to one another. And the more we become like Christ, the more he becomes identified with us. And we do this through love. The secret is out. Jesus, our God, walks with us. The secret is out. Jesus is the Son of God. The secret is out. He invites us to be His brothers and sisters through love. And Benedict says it well. Benedict XVI in Deus es Caritas. A Christian knows when it is time to speak of God and when it is better to say nothing and let love alone speak.